Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Franz Fanon is remembered as one of the great revolutionary theorists of the 20th century. His books have influenced everyone from Che Guevara to Malcolm X and from the Black Panthers to the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And his works are considered foundational to decolonization studies today. But he was much more than just a revolutionary writer and thinker. He was a revolutionary himself. He joined the National Liberation Front in Algeria's struggle for independence in the 1950s. That experience affected him deeply and helped lead to the writing of his iconic book, The Wretched of the Earth. Today we're going to be in conversation about the life and the works of Franz Fanon. My guest is Adam Schatz. Adam Schatz has written a biography called The Rebel's Clinic, The Revolutionary Lives of Franz Fanon. Adam Schatz is also the U.S. editor of the London Review of Books. Adam Schatz, it is my good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thank you so much, Mitch. What I didn't say in that quick sketch of Franz Fanon, a uh, very brief uh, explanation of who Franz Fanon was, is something I think is very important. And before he was a revolutionary, he was a psychiatrist as well. And I do want to go through his life with you chronologically and really get into who Franz Fanon was. But before we do that, um, I think most people have heard, at least our listeners have heard the name Franz Fanon. Perhaps they've seen a quote on social media or in someone's article, a quote like this I have here, imperialism leaves behind germs of rot, which we must clinically detect and remove from our land, but from our minds as well. But I don't know how many people, and I would consider myself in this category as well, before I started preparing for our introduction, how many of us actually really understood who Franz Fanon was. So just here at the beginning, beyond what I have said, what do you think is important to know about Franz Fanon before we get into his the specifics of his life? Well, I mean, I do think it's important to remember that Franz Fanon was a West Indian. I mean, he's often misunderstood and thought to be an Algerian or an African, but in fact, he was a man from, from Martinique, from Fort de France, from one of France's so-called old colonies. Um, uh, he was also a psychiatrist. Um, he was also a deeply literary man. Uh, Fanon uh, had the ambition to become a playwright or a poet when he was studying uh, to become a doctor um, in Lyon. Um, the reason that I uh, referred to the revolutionary lives, plural, of Franz Fanon is that Fanon was many things, and he participated in numerous rebellions and revolutions, not only uh, the struggle against uh, colonialism, um, in Algeria and in Africa. And I wanted to honor the plurality of Fanon's existence. Again, uh, he's born in 1925 in Martinique. Um, Martinique is in the Caribbean. Uh, it's important to know about Martinique is that uh, it was a colony of France. I mean, in some ways still is, has still, I mean, aren't, aren't it's a, it, it's, 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 admin, it's a department um, of, uh, of France. It was departmentalized um, under the guidance of uh, the great statesman and poet Aimé Césaire, uh, one of the founders of the Negritude movement, who was a mentor of Fanon. And Fanon and Césaire famously disagreed about the um, the ultimate fate of the French West Indies or Antilles. Fanon believed ultimately that the Antilles should seek independence, perhaps some kind of federation and independence against France, whereas uh, Aimé Césaire um, believed that its only viable future lay in remaining connected to France. But yes, in many ways, um, a kind of neo-colonialism persists um, in Martinique. An important but part Martinique, about Martinique's, Martinique's vote in France, as yeah. it were. Martinique is considered a part of France. And that's kind of important in understanding Franz Fanon's work as well, right? Because even as well, a young yeah, man, he I, saw himself a, as a Frenchman. Of course. I mean, Fanon is born a French person. You know, it's important to remember that he's born a French person, a French citizen. Um, and it's only much later that he uh, begins to understand himself as a black man, um, owing to some profoundly disillusioning experiences that he has as a fighter against fascism with the, with the French free forces. And then later, as a medical student um, in Lyon, he has this shattering realization that no, in the eyes of French people, he's not seen as just another French person. He is seen as a black man because Fanon grew up like many Martinicans of color at, at that time. He grew up with the idea that 
the only thing that separated him from other French people was the color of his skin. He was a French a Frenchman of color, uh, not a black man. Uh, uh, black men were the Africans, the African soldiers that they were called tireurs senegalais, Senegalese riflemen, um, whom he encountered um, on the streets of Martinique as a young man, whom he regarded with a mixture of fascination and fear. They were exotic to him. Those were blacks. He was not black. He was French. But when Fanon got to France, he realized that that wasn't true. He actually was a black man in the eyes of the French. And that 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 um, catapulted him on a journey of self-discovery as a black man and ultimately as a participant in revolutions against France. As a young man, he was interested in the French Revolution, the history of the French Revolutionary War, and then the Haitian Revolutionary War, which obviously is closely connected well, very, to the French Revolution. Very much so. I mean, you know, his parents, uh, his father was a civil servant, um, customs inspector. He grew up in a middle class home. Uh, there were servants. There were piano lessons. This He did not grow up in poverty. Um, he grew up as a member of the elite of color um, in Martinique. Um, and his parents were uh, fierce believers in France and in equality, liberty, and fraternity. They were great believers in the promise that the French Revolution had extended to uh, the formerly uh, enslaved. And one of the great myths, of course, in Martinique had to do with the contribution of a man named Victor Schelcher. The high school that uh, the lycée that Fanon attended was named after Schelcher. There was a statue of Schelcher um, in the, the the principal town square in Martinique. Schelcher, of course, was the man who had presided over abolition um, in 1848. He was the son of a, of a porcelain manufacturer who had discovered the horror of slavery. Um, but Fanon, when he was very young, began to wonder, why is it that I'm told I should be grateful to this white man for my freedom. What about us? What's our history? Um, the first three words that he learns in to write in school are je suis français, I am French. He's taught that his ancestors are the Gauls. That's what all children throughout the French empire were taught, when in fact their ancestors were not the Gauls. And so um, uh, on the one hand, Fanon is a deep believer in the message of the French Revolution, freedom, equality, uh, uh, liberty for all peoples. It inspires him. It's partly what inspires him to join the struggle against Nazism. Um, but eventually, he starts to question the myths of French universalism. He starts to question the idea that... Um, that France's promise of equality, liberty, liberty, and fraternity has really been fulfilled um, in, obviously, in the in the colonies and to people of color. Um, and so his search, you might argue, is one for a more radical and inclusive and expansive kind of universalism. It's still very much influenced by the French revolutionary model, but it's an anti-colonial one. How important is his experience? I want to I want to add one more thing, Mitch, if you don't mind, which is that. Fanon really didn't know much about the slave revolts that had taken place in Martinique. Uh, his ancestors were not docile. They did not, they did not passively accept French rule. Uh, they did not passively accept being enslaved. But he wasn't really aware of these revolts. And I think that Fanon had a certain shame about the, the, his, his own perception that Martinique had been passive and had merely been granted its freedom unlike Haiti, hmm. where Toussaint Louverture had presided over a violent revolution of slaves um, against their masters. And so there's a kind of envy about Haiti, right? Haiti is the country that revolted. Martinique is the country that remained passive. And uh, Fanon, of course, becomes committed to the idea that freedom is not worthy of the name unless you fought for it, unless you've bled for it. And so his ideas, the ideas that he later later articulates about violence, identity, and freedom, uh, we have to remember, are grounded in his own reading of the West Indian experience. He, he, he finds out about Martinique's history later on? 
Not really, actually. He he never. I don't think he ever really investigated Martinique's history with any great depth. He he remained quite uh, quite critical of Martinique, even though he owed a great debt to it, especially to its poets, to people like Aimé Césaire. So he had a he had a strong attachment to Martinique's culture. But I think that um, he never got over the feeling that um, that Martinique had in some way failed politically. What was the importance of M.A. Césaire? Well, M.A. Césaire is the founder, along with Leopold Sangor and uh, Léon Gontras Damas, Léon Gontran Damas, of the Negritude movement. They are, they are students in Paris in the 1930s. Damas is Guadeloupian, Sangor, Senegalese. Sen Sen Senegalese and uh, Césaire, Martinican, and as students in Paris in the 1930s, they begin to develop uh, a movement and a philosophy known as Negritude that um, that begins to celebrate and praise and valorize Black culture, Black identity in different ways. They have different versions of this. Songor's version is quite different from Césaire's, but it's a it's a kind of early Black pride movement. And uh, Césaire's poetry is uh, almost proto-surrealist. And in fact, uh, Césaire is discovered by one of the great surrealists, André Breton, who hails him as a great black poet um, in the early 1940s. That's a description that Fanon hated. He thought that Césaire should be celebrated as a great poet, not as a great black poet. He found it, he found it offensive. Um, but Césaire's great poem return the it's called le cahier d'un retour au pays natal the notebook of return to the native land is uh this extraordinary allegory of the black experience from slavery to colonization to revolt and it is vivid it is violent it is ecstatic and it is in a sense the poetic analog of a book like hundred years of solitude it tells the story of a people and Césaire also published a book in the early 1950s when he was still a member of the Communist Party called Discourse on Colonialism. And Discor Discourse on Colonialism had as its thesis the idea that colonialism decivilizes the colonizer, that it gives free reign to the most violent and aggressive impulses of the people who colonize. And so Césaire's ideas uh, about colonialism and the uh, kind of ecstatic nature of his prose and his celebration of blackness as a form of self-invention and self-creation. All of these ideas Fanon picks up and makes his own. Um, they had many disagreements and uh, in many ways Fanon's arguments are um, a challenge to the elder man, um, but you can't separate Fanon from Césaire. And in fact, the most moving tribute or hom our homage to Fanon written after his death at the age of 36 in December 1961 was penned by Aimé Césaire. Interesting. Franz Fanon fights in World War II against the Nazis. After World War II, he stays in France and, and goes to medical school. Mm -hmm. He left briefly to return to Martinique, then he came back. And he was in Paris, and he was trying to figure out where he might go. He was benefiting from a scholarship that um, he um, had won uh, by virtue of the fact that he had served in the French army. He had been he had been wounded. He had also been given a croix de guerre um, and the medal placed on his lapel. It was there. It was placed there by a, named, a man named Raoul Salon. Salon later emerges as one of the hardcore defenders of French Algeria. In other words, a great adversary. Of Franz Fanon. Um, so he was in Paris trying to figure out exactly when, what he wanted to study. He thought of perhaps studying dentistry. He eventually decides to go to medical school in Lyon. Why Lyon? He chooses Lyon for an interesting reason. He chooses Lyon because he wants to be in a place that is a bit milkier than in Paris. And what he meant by that he, was that he was seeking out a place where there wasn't as significant a community of West Indians and Africans. Now in Paris, he would have found a community. There were other black and African people, and including intellectuals, um, with whom he may have had very lively conversation. But Fanon was someone who was drawn to challenges. And he wanted the challenge of being in a white majority city, 
and um, fighting out on his own terms. And, and Lyon was not a welcoming place to outsiders, and it was not welcoming to Fanon. And it, these were difficult years for him, but they were also the years in which he um, came to define himself and, uh, and uh, embrace psychiatry. One of his early teachers of psychiatry was a man by the name of Francois Toscaïs. Toscaïs. Toscaïs, yeah. forgive me. Who, who was Francois Toscaïs? So, uh, Fanon, after, after doing his work um, in Lyon, getting his degree, and it was in Lyon that he wrote his first book, Black Skin, White Masks, um, ends up going to um, a place called the Saint Alban Asylum in the southwest of France to do his residency. And his mentor there, and they eventually become close collaborators, is Francois Tosquelles, whom you just mentioned. And Tosquelles is a Catalan psychiatrist. Um, he uh, was the person who organized the psychiatric services of the PUM, the anarcho Trotskyist um, army, militia, that fought uh, against the fascists in Spain, Tosquelles, uh, the Spanish Civil War, the Spanish Civil War. So Tosquelles was um, he was a, a very iconoclastic leftist and a psychoanalyst, as well as a psychiatrist, um, who uh, was forced into exile because of the war, and ends up in France in a refugee camp. And uh, he was discovered. He was discovered practicing psychiatry in that refugee camp by uh, a doctor named Paul Balve, who was at the um, Saint Alban Asylum. And the Saint Alban Asylum was an extraordinary place. It was a place of very innovative forms of therapy, and it was a place where where the mentally ill survived during World War II. During World War II, between forty and fifty thousand mentally ill people died in France of starvation, of malnutrition, of various diseases, not at Saint Alban. They survived there because they had these progressive doctors who did everything do who did everything they could to protect the people living there and also to provide sanctuary for resistance fighters and for uh writers like Paul Eluard, the poet, and jo and Georges Canguillem, a historian of science. And so Tosquelles had ended up there uh, in 39 and uh, presided over radical experiments in psychiatry, a kind of group psychiatry that focused on creating micro societies that resembled the worlds that the patients had inhabited outside of the hospital so that they could be reintegrated into a sense of joy, of life, you know, um, and Fanon had been very interested in what was going on at Saint Alban while he was studying in Lyon. And so he goes to Saint Alban and forges this very close connection uh, with Tosquelles. And Tosquelles is the person from whom he learns the ideas of what was then called institutional psychiatry or what Fanon, Fanon would call social therapy. And it's that kind of therapy that Fanon ends up practicing in Algeria. Does Fanon begin practicing with? Algerian Alger, Algerians in France first is he did. this sort of where he, did, he starts fact. to formulate many of his ideas he did he did in fact he did um uh, Fanon uh in the late 1940s um uh, during his uh, studies in medical school began to see uh, uh patients in a neighborhood in in Lyon on the Rue de Mancy uh who were mostly Algerian they were North African laborers mostly of Algerian origin um, these were men who were sending back remittances um, uh, to their families in Algeria. They were living uh, very isolated um, lives. They were uh, subject to um, to racism, to um, segregation, to all sorts of um, demeaning experiences. Um, and many of them uh, were falling sick. They were uh, complaining of... Um, of ailments and discomfort, um, but they couldn't identify what it was they what it was that was making them sick. Couldn't identify a lesion. And French doctors had described their condition collectively as the North African syndrome. In other words, the suggestion uh, that these doctors were making was that these men were imagining their illness. 
they were hallucinating or for that matter they might be providing an excuse for not going to work they were lazy they were lazy irrational hallucinating and uh so Fanon was early on in his career coming up against the racist and colonial misconceptions of the French medical profession of and of his and ultimately of his own profession psychiatry although at that point he was just a general practitioner and he wrote uh, an extraordinary early article published in the French uh, left-wing Catholic journal Esprit called North African Syndrome in which he argued essentially that what was making these men sick was racism they were these men were uh, so-called French Muslims of Algeria, Francais musulmans d'Algérie. That was their ca that was their juridical category. So these French Muslims Algeria were were told repeatedly that they were French. They were force fed with French idea, French culture, the French language, and yet the reality was that they could never be French. They were not equal. They were discriminated against. They were oppressed. And um, Fanon's argument was that that experience, that experience of oppression could actually result in physical and psychological symptoms of acute distress. So he was very early in his in his career, and this is he was only about 26 then, Fanon was seized by these, you know, remarkably lucid insights about the connection between political oppression and mental health. I mean, today, these ideas, I think, are widely accepted. Back then, they were extremely novel and challenging insights. This so, would yes. Even before he went to Algeria, he was working with Algerians. And my argument in this book is that working with these men on the Rue de Mancy uh, led Fanon to become a psychiatrist. And a revolutionary? Not yet. He was not a revolutionary then. He was a person of certainly strong anti-colonial convictions and we can see those expressed in his first book black skin white masks but he did not yet define himself as a revolutionary and what's more he continued to find it to define himself as french and black skin white mask is in many ways um a kind of eloquent appeal for inclusion in france he's not arguing for any kind of independence he's not arguing for revolution although he's already expressing um sympathies for uh groups like the Viet Minh there's a there's a sentence in that book in black skin white mask which is often quoted um was often quoted actually during the black lives matter protests that um uh, uh the people revolt when they can no longer breathe and he was actually saying that about the Viet Minh and contrasting the Viet Minh with the poets of negritude he said that um they did not revolt on behalf of a culture they revolted because they could no longer breathe. And that was uh, an implicit rebuke to the negritude poets like Songor, who were focused on the creation, the, the recovery of an ancient black culture, but who were not politically um, committed to decolonization. And he was contrasting the Viet Minh favorably with um, with the negritude movement. That That part of the quote is often lost in the citation. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Adam Schatz, author of the book, The Rebels Clinic, The Revolutionary Lives of Franz Fanon. Adam Schatz is also the U.S. editor of the London Review of Books. Is, is it Franz Fanon's experience with these Algerians in France working as a psychiatrist that would lead him to Algeria? He gets to Algeria before the revolution breaks out, doesn't he? He does, and and it certainly uh, would be an attractive and cinematic idea that um, working with Algerians led him to <clears throat> Algeria and led him to become involved in the revolt, but that's actually not what happened. Um, in fact, uh, Fanon, um, in when he finished uh, his, his work with the Saint-Alban Clinic, uh, wanted to go to Senegal, and he wrote to Leopold Sangor, um, never received a reply. He also wrote a letter to Richard Wright, um, whose work uh, he quotes extensively uh, in Black Skin, White Masks. Um, and he announced to Richard Wright that he uh, hoped to write um, a monograph about Wright's work. There's no record of a reply from Wright. Um, so since he didn't want to go back to Martinique, he was very clear about that. He did not want to return home. And because he didn't hear back from Senegal, he jumped at the opportunity to go to Algeria when it presented itself. Um, his reasons for going to Algeria 
were the reasons of most young fonctionnaires, civil servants. He, um, it was a great opportunity. Uh, Fanon at that point was married to a, <clears throat> a woman named Josie Fanon, Josie Dublé. And uh, they were hoping to start a family and uh, it was a good opportunity. Um, and I think what, what needs to be underscored here too, is that it was very common in those days uh, for France to send as its emissaries uh, to the colonies uh, educated, quote-unquote, assimilated or evolved, évolué, that was the term used, evolved West Indians um, as examples of the glories of French civilization. So he was sent there uh, for a reason. Uh, uh, he was uh, His identity was not incidental um he was not going there to take part in a revolution but 11 months after he arrived in algeria he arrived in december 1953 uh the revolt broke out um the fln launched its insurrection on november 1st 1954 all saints day and uh fanon was drawn into that um uh, months later and the fln specifically well, the F yes, the FLN is the group, the Front de Libération Nationale, the National Liberation Front, was the group uh, that launched the revolt. But the FLN, you have to remember, was at the time a very small group um, composed of um, several hundred, mostly young men who had been protégés of the founding father of modern Algerian nationalism, a man named Masali Haj, who led a party called the Movement for the Triumph of Democratic Liberties, the MTLD. And these were young men who were growing tired of uh, Masali Haj's cult of personality and his unwillingness to launch a revolt. Masali Haj felt that the time wasn't quite right for that. And these young men thought it was time to act. And that um, that impatience and that audacity certainly appealed to, uh, to Fanon. How easy was it, get, was it to get accepted or even get you know get into the fln here's an outsider who just arrived to algeria you're you're an organization that you know the authorities would very much like to to stamp out oh certainly and they and the french did their friends uh, responded ruthlessly um fanon uh fanon's history with the fln is is quite striking because um uh what happened was that uh fanon uh, began to meet uh, Europeans who were close to the FLN in Algiers. These were mostly uh, Catholic leftists um, who were grouped around uh, a French classicist named André Mandouz. Mandouz had been a resistance fighter uh, during the Second World War in, in France. He edited a journal called Christian Witness, a, a témoignage chrétien. Mandouz had, had moved to Algeria in, uh, I believe, 1947 or, or, or 48. Um, and, uh, and, and was very, very sympathetic to uh, the yearnings of Algerians for um, independence as soon as he arrived. He made his decision early on. And around Mandouz gathered a group of, of young people um, who were Europeans, sympathetic to uh, the FLN, and eventually joined the FLN. Uh, one of them was a man named Pierre Cholet, who was a doctor, and he and his wife, uh, Claudine, uh, were FLN supporters. And so was Pierre Cholet's sister, Anne-Marie, who was married to a clandestine member of the FLN, um, Sala Luanchi. And Fanon uh, was giving lectures to groups of leftist Christians um, in Algiers. And uh, it was these leftist Christians who um, helped him to make contact uh, with the FLN. Eventually, a, a, a rather wealthy Algerian uh, came to the Blida Hospital pretending to undergo treatment. He was an FLN member. And through this man, uh, Fanon set up uh, a clinic, uh, a clandestine clinic for FLN fighters, mostly wounded FLN, FLN fighters. And these men uh, were provided with, uh, with health care um, and with um, also with psychological counseling. So it was really through these Catholic left circles that Fanon had already made contact with in France, because as I noted earlier, he was writing for the journal Esprit. And Esprit was a precociously anti-colonial journal of the Catholic left. Now you might ask, why wasn't he working with, with the French Communist Party? 
And the reason is that the French Communist Party and the Algerian Communist Party, as a result, um, were very slow to embrace the independent struggle. Um, the French Communist Party um, had long argued that Algerians would have to wait until a proletarian revolution uh, triumphed in France. Um, they looked very askance at Algerian nationalism. And um, although eventually the communists of Algeria came to support the FLN, the FLN, for understandable reasons, was so um, upset at their initial stance, which included supporting the special powers vote 1955 or 56, that they insisted that the communists dissolve as an organization. So the Communist Party ceased to exist if you and 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 join the FLN as a whole in the late 1950s. Um, so the Catholic left really was among the Europeans who were sympathetic to the FLN. The Catholic left was the was the avant garde. Interesting. Um, did, did, was the FLN secular? Complicated question. Um, the FLN was a uh, a nationalist organization. Um, influenced um, by Islam, but not Islamist. There were Islamist members in the FLN. Most of them were close to the association of the ulama, which was a, a kind of a proto-Islamist party. The FLN, remember, was not a party. The FLN was a front. And a front is a group that includes all manner of political tendencies. It included um, nationalist liberals, it included Marxists, it included Islamists, it included um, uh, members of the of the Algerian elite who uh, wanted freedom for their people. Um, uh, it included any number of 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 of, um, of groups. There was no um, ideology that it espoused, really, aside from we would like independence from France within a framework of Islamic values. So I think that, you know, there's a tendency to refer to the FLN as a secular nationalist group. Um, in my view, that is a simplification and it ignores the fact that that Arab Islamic identity was quite important to the FLN. Um, so, yeah. France so, Fanon. So, and so for that, so for that, for that reason as well, Fanon was even more of an, of an outsider because he was he an was atheist. Not Arab. Yeah. He was not Berber. He was an atheist, and he did not speak Arabic or Amazir, the Berber language. He was an outsider. I mean, and that is the theme of this book. Fanon is a foreign revolutionary, foreign-born revolutionary, who makes the Algerian cause, who adopts the Algerian cause, and comes to think of himself as an Algerian. And um, to some extent, this was a fantasy, uh, but to some extent, it expressed the genuine hope shared by certain people within the FLN who were themselves progressive leftists. And the people Fanon was meeting in Blida, which is where he was working, um, in the FLN, tended to be left-wing progressives, Marxists and socialists, often of Kabyl Berber origin. That was the FLN of the interior that, FLN, that, uh, that, that Fanon uh, uh, came to know. Um, and so he had he had some reasons for thinking that perhaps the Algeria of the future would be multi-ethnic and secular. As an atheist himself, did Franz Fanon ever reflect about the Islamic aspect of the FLN? Not explicitly. And there is a tendency, as many commentators on Fanon have remarked, including the uh, scholar of North Africa, Jacques Berck, um, as well as Mohamed Harbi, the great Algerian historian who knew Fanon and who was an important source for me, um, Fanon had a tendency uh, to understate the significance of, of Islam. Um, in the countryside, uh, the FLN had no choice but to invoke uh, Islam uh, when it was recruiting uh, members of the peasantry because the language of anti-colonialism was not a language that most people spoke. For them, it was a struggle against the foreigner, against um, against the Christians, um, and you had to use this millenarian language to mobilize people. So even if you were a kind of left progressive member of the FLN, you had to meet people where they were. 
and 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 so Islam became, you know, a potent tool of recruitment. Now, Fanon uh, would write, and I think very um, interesting and suggestive ways about um, certain symbols of Islam, such as the veil. Um, he published uh, a book in 1959 called a "Dying Colonialism." The French title was the was Year Five of the Algerian Revolution. And one of uh, the most captivating chapters in that book is called Algeria Unveiled. Now, um, there's a very, I think, you know, it's worth noting that the reason, one of the reasons that Fanon published this chapter, focusing on the meanings, the various significations of the veil worn by Algerian women, is that at the time, this is around 1958, France had launched a so-called modernization campaign in the hope that by winning over Algerian women, it would then it would end up winning over their men. And so what it did was to stage these ceremonies in which Algerian women were um, uh, uh, removed the hijab well, the, or the Algerian veil, the Hayek, um, and walked on the streets without it. And the French were 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 celeb were advertising these ceremonies as examples of the way in which in the way the, were exa- were ce- celebrating this as a way of advertising the ways in which the French were emancipating Algerian women from uh from their from patriarchy. In other words, as you know g- the literary theorist Gayatri Spivak would say, uh, freeing brown women from brown men. Um and uh Fanon was not um, obviously not an Islamist, and obviously uh, Fanon had no particular commitment to 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 the veil. Um, he was, I think, agnostic about it. Um, but uh, in his essay on on Algeria unveiled, he argues that when Algerian women remove the veil uh, to disguise themselves as European women and to place bombs. Um, in various locations in the cities. These are uh, episodes from the history of the Battle of Algiers, which uh, several years later, Gilo Pontecorvo would restage in the Battle of Algiers. Fanon argued that when these Algerian women removed the veil and disguised themselves as Europeans, they acquired a new relationship to their bodies. They became aware of their, of their power. Um, they were, in effect, not only emancipating themselves from colonialism, they were emancipating themselves from patriarchy. And he, and he predicted that by virtue of their involvement in the struggle, they would, they would create, they would end up laying the groundwork for, um, women's freedom in Algeria, uh, after the revolution. Now, when I say this, I want to emphasize Fanon wasn't saying that women should wear the veil or shouldn't wear the veil. He was agnostic on that. He felt the veil could be a symbol of defiance to the French as well. His argument essentially was that the veil had no inherent significance. It had to be understood in context and again and in terms of the state of the struggle with the French. But his prediction was not borne out. So, you know, Fanon imagined that the that the struggle against colonialism might quote unquote modernize um, Algerian gender relations. Um, in fact, what happened after the Algerian War was that um, Algeria ended up with one of the most regressive um, uh, laws on, on on marriage and inheritance in the entire region, and Algerian women have been fighting uh, for their rights ever since. It's not a country that has been terribly forgiving uh, towards towards women, um, although it has a strong women's movement. Um, so Fanal's predictions were not always borne out, but he was interested, certainly, um, in religion and culture. He was. And he wrote about it, too, in his psychiatric writings. Um, there are remarkable passages in the psychiatric writings about, for example, possession ceremonies, about the ways in which local, local, um, the ways in which Algerians treated the mentally ill in a way that was very different from the way that Europeans did. And he found it to be much more forgiving. I mean, Alger- Al- Algeria had a big impact on Fanon. And I argue in this book that Fanon owed much more to Algeria than Algeria owed to him, ultimately. Interesting to hear about France and the veil. They, they've been trying to do this, get away with this veil for, or the hijab or whatever it may be for, for quite some time, it sounds like. Um, oh, his, his, his remarks on, on the French obsession with the veil and the French determination to remove the veil and to make Algerian or Muslim women visible to French men 
His arguments about that remain stunningly relevant today. The movie Battle of Algiers, I, I appreciate you bringing it up because I do want to ask about that. that. That film was instructive to a lot of people, including myself, in understanding actually the politics of terrorism. And, and just briefly, it's usually a, 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 you know, a, a weaker power, at least militarily speaking, that's being colonized. Um, they conduct a terrorist act, bombs in cafes and restaurants, which is terrorizing everyone, including uh, the local people. Um, and everyone's you know, outraged by it. But what it ends up doing is provokes it, an overreaction from the, the powerful. And in that overreaction, ultimately unites the locals against that outside power um maybe that may not have been a great description of that dynamic but no but that is that is that is certainly the dynamic in in algeria I mean, that's that's certainly what happened the fln uh partly owed its um its rising popularity to the ruthless repression that the french carried out against algerian rebels um in which the vast majority of people who suffered were were civilians that, that was definitely part of the dynamic there did the book that would come out of Franz Fanon's experience in Algeria is his iconic book, The Wretched of the Earth. The first chapter is, and it's much more, his book's much more than about political violence. I want to talk to you about that. But his first chapter is about political violence. Does Franz Fanon play a, t tell me about Franz Fanon's approach towards political violence. Well, Franz, the first chapter of the Wretched of the Earth is called De la Violence, on violence, uh, and it is a defense of armed struggle, but I think that it has to be also be understood as a diagnostic analysis by a psychiatrist. I mean, he's, he's, and, and I think that even before we talk about Fanon's approach to violence, it has to be underscored that Fanon is talking about a counter violence. The world that the colonized inhabit is a world that was created by violence um french algeria is the product of an invasion that was extremely violent uh, the french invaded algeria in 1830 and over the next four decades about a third of algeria's population perished of violence and of disease um, the french raised people's land the french lit fires outside of caves in which Algerians had taken sanctuary and asphyxiated them. Um, and then each time Algerians rose up to defend their rights, to assert their national existence, the French responded with overwhelming force. Nine years before, uh, eight years before Fanon arrived in Algeria, um, on V-Day, 1945, uh, Algerians had risen up, they had um, held up flags, banners of the banned Algerian Nationalist Party. Um, dozens of Europeans were killed in riots, and the French responded by carrying out military operations in which roughly, we'll never know the, we'll never know the, the actual number, 15,000 Algerians were killed. So, um, it's important to, to mention all of this because I think there's this notion that somehow anti-colonial violence occurs in a void. It, it does not. It's fed by memories of violence, aggression, and injustice by the colonizer. And Fanon, um, in the essay on violence that opens the wretched of the earth, is, is interested in the, the psychological effects that violence has on the mind of the colonized. You know, the colonized person is someone who, is, who has endured feelings of passivity, of futility, of despair, of being depersonalized, dehumanized, of being alienated. And remember that Fanon's, uh, one of Fanon's concepts is disalienation. He wants to liberate the colonized from the alienation that he or she experiences in life. And so violence is a, as, is a central way in which the colonized overcome that sense of impotence and be, begin to experience themselves as human beings. Now, this is an idea um, that is grounded in 
frankly, in Western philosophy. This is an idea that one can find in the work of Hegel, the essay on the master and the, the master and the bondsman. And Fanon was very much, uh, very much a Hegelian. And so Fanon makes this argument for armed struggle um, in, in that essay. Um, and he certainly defends um, uh, uh, armed action as a necessary phase in an anti-colonial struggle. And he, he includes phrases that, you know, would end up being quoted by many revolutionary anti-colonial groups, um, such as the colonized liberates himself in and through violence. But what's often forgotten um, in the denunciation of Fanon as, as, um, as an advocate of violence, or for that matter, in the celebration of Fanon as a champion of violence, is that Fanon also includes warnings in that essay on violence. For example, he argues that at first, in the early stages of combat, the colonized will see any colonizer as an enemy, uh, adopting what he calls the primitive Manichaeanism of the colonial system. But at a certain point, and under a wise leadership, the colonized will realize that there are members of the colonizing community who are more radical than members of the colonized community. And that, and they will also realize that they have to move beyond the politics of hatred, re resentment, uh, uh, and the desire for vengeance. Um, and the last chapter of The Wretched of the Earth is an incredible anatomy of the effects of violence on the minds of the colonized, which Fanon predicts will be enduring. And in that chapter, Colonial Warfare and Mental Disorders, Fanon writes not only about the impact of colonial violence on the colonized psyche, he writes about the impact of armed struggle. He writes of anti-colonial fighters who are still haunted by actions that they undertook during wars of liberation, actions that have seared themselves into their memories and which they are not going to easily overcome. So although Fanon is certainly a defender of armed struggle, he's someone who is deeply aware of its pitfalls and its costs. And I think this is often forgotten. Why is it forgotten? In my view, it has a great deal to do with the fact that Fanon is a black man advocating self-defense and violence. And uh, in a sense, you could argue he's subjected to the same treatment as a figure like Malcolm X. And it's extraordinary how a thinker of such range, such dazzling range and insight can be reduced to the question of violence. I think if Fanon were white, he would not be. I mean, look at Jean-Paul Sartre. Jean-Paul Sartre, whom Fanon admired deeply and who wrote the preface the incendiary preface to the Register of the Earth, which is far more ecstatic in its praise of violence than anything Fanon wrote, is Sartre remembered as an advocate of violence? Is Sartre remembered as someone who was a violent man? No, he's not. He's remembered for the richness, the totality of his work, and yet Fanon is not. So I think that, you know, perhaps we have to analyze the fetishization of Fanon as prophet of violence. Maybe that says more about Maybe that says more about his critics than it says about him. Franz Fanon was writing The Wretched of the Earth as he was dying from leukemia? Yes, yes. He died in uh, December 1961 of leukemia in, of all places, Bethesda, Maryland. He disliked the United States very much. He called it the country of lynchers. His relationship to the United States is quite complex. Yes, he regarded the United States as an imperialist country. He certainly uh, was deeply aware of its racism. And yet he was also a great admirer of black American writers in particular. He was um, a devoted reader of Richard Wright and, and Chester Himes. Why, why is he in? He's at a Walter Reed Medical Hospital right where he spends his final days well he ends up in in in, in bethesda because um he had gone for treatment um in the soviet union uh, it hadn't quite worked out he was very very sick and the fln um, was approached by uh, an american man named uh, ali islin who was a cia officer and uh, islin was interested in in north african independence movements and uh the americans were aware that the FLN was going to win the war, and they wanted to uh, make an overture to the FLN because they were concerned that Algeria might fall into the hands of the Soviet Union. 
And so as a, as a goodwill gesture, they made arrangements for Fanon to be treated in Washington. And Fanon was not happy about this and he protested, but ultimately he had no choice. And so he ended up not going there and dying there. Adam and Schatz. I want, and I want to add that there's some poetic, uh, there's something poetic about the fact that he dies in the United States at the same time, because it is in the United States and largely thanks to black Americans and to uh, the Black Panthers in particular, that Fanon, after his death, is resurrected. It's in, it's in the United States where his work begins to acquire its status in the history of thought. A status he didn't have during his life. No, no he, was known to the, he was known to the left. He was certainly an important figure in Algeria and, and in Africa and, among, and on the French left. But he only becomes a really global figure after his death, um, and it is particularly the Black Panthers, as well as, you know, groups like the uh, like the PLO that adopt him, uh, but particularly among black Americans. He's always had a particularly close relationship to black intellectuals in the States. Adam Schatz has been our guest. He has joined us for a conversation about his book called The Rebels Clinic, The Revolutionary Lives of Franz Fanon. Adam Schatz, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you so much.